I was watching a documentary recently and it showed a group of climbers attempting to get to the top of Mount Everest. At one point they encountered a crevasse, which is different than a crevice. A crevasse is a deep crack in the terrain of glacial ice. Um, and they can be incredibly deep, and especially at higher elevations when the landscape shifts and the ice becomes more brittle. Um, sometimes the bridge to cross these divides is a natural ice formation called ice bridges. But often the connection from one side to the other has to be created by humans who drop a ladder or multiple ladders tied together with rope across the gaping ice valley. As I watched this demonstration of grit, determination, and on some level, complete irrationality, I thought, this feels a lot like what I do for a living. <laughs> I'm a chief diversity officer at a large university. Every day, I travel across real and perceived crevasses. I step on shaky ladders trying not to look down into the dark depths of ideological divides, all in an effort to summit that quote unquote mountaintop of shared understanding, inclusion, peace, dignity, respect, and justice. Chief diversity officers like me tend to believe that the only way for a group or an organization or a nation to be whole is to find any possible way across these differences that exist between us as human beings. And we offer a lot of advice. We have tools and tips and case studies and scenarios and hypotheticals. And <laughs> this is especially true of those of us in higher education. We lean heavily on evidence-based practices. And did you hear my voice drop when I said that? <laughs> now for me, restorative practice has been my go-to evidence-based way forward across the crevasses. Restorative practice, or RP, holds people in their humanity even when they do harm. It resists shaking that finger and morally judging a person. It moves forward with a person rather than doing something to or for them. It dialogues rather than debates. It actively listens, it counsels, it consoles, and ultimately, it forgives. All of these principles I held up as sacred and true, the answer to reaching that proverbial mountaintop. Well, in 2016, my professional medal was tested and shaken to its roots. That year, I had been married for 24 years to someone who is pretty much my polar opposite. He's white, I'm black. He's an athlete, I don't even like to sweat. <laughs> like ever. <laughs> He's a saver, I'm a spender. He's a Cuban refugee from Havana. I was born in Akron, Ohio. He's a retired police officer. I think it's good to challenge authority. <laughs> He's conservative, and I'm liberal. We usually voted most of the times for opposite parties, he Republican and me Democrat. And we often joked that we canceled each other out during election, so why should we even vote? It kind of wasn't an issue. It was a constant lesson. It kind of sharpened and rounded out our own ideas. And we always had a worthy partner to debate and, and talk about these things. We never went too deep into politics, but it was fine, and I appreciated that. 2016 signaled a whole new dimension of our differences, though. The stakes got much higher that year. My alarm and concern over the Republican presidential candidate, Donald Trump, was well known in our household. I was loud and outraged over his public statements that to me were hateful and offensive, particularly as they related to issues of race and gender and sexual identity and class and disability and national origin, all of the things. Regardless of the many, many different reasons people gave for supporting Trump, I could not reason away the fact that I believed his candidacy was dangerous and I felt like he was stirring up an us versus them dynamic 
and fanning the flames of social division. As election day got closer, my protests and threats grew louder. If this guy wins, anyone who votes for this guy. And the louder I grew, the more silent my husband became. <laughs> One day he spoke up and he said, I can't vote for Clinton, but I know if I vote for Trump, you and I are going to have problems, so I'm not going to vote at all. And on the one hand, I thought, good. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, I felt like I was kind of suppressing his vote, and I didn't like that feeling. So on the night before Election Day, I said to him, you should vote the way you want to vote, the way you think is best. As a person who immigrated into this nation, whose family risked it all to get here, you're entitled to all of the freedoms that people died for, like the right to vote. So vote the way you think is best, the way you want to vote, unencumbered and free. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> he voted for Trump. And as we all know, Trump won. And it was the beginning of the greatest challenge to our relationship that we ever faced. I was staring down the deepest, most treacherous crevasse I could imagine. A vote for Trump transcended politics for me. It wasn't about the policies. A vote for him felt like a vote against me. Everything I am, everything I believe in, everything I stand for, everything I work towards. How could the person I trusted more than anyone in the world do that? Besides the fact that I told him to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think he'd listen to me. <laughs> he never listens to me. <laughs> It felt really personal. Gone were the restorative practices, the active listening, the inquiring posture, the ladders and the bridges, the patience, the inquiring mind. Gone were the days of our pretty well-balanced liberal conservative seesaw life. All I felt was rage and disappointment and deep, deep personal betrayal. This political climate was pushing us to extreme breaking points. And we spent the next few years dancing a very sad waltz. The list of safe topics of conversation grew shorter and shorter. No more watching the news together. I was polite and distant. I stopped holding his hand. I stopped laughing at his jokes. Our most engaging moments occurred when we were arguing. Privately, he started thinking about an exit strategy, and so was I. One day, right around the time Trump issued his executive order limiting speech about race, I was facilitating a workshop on how to disrupt microaggressions and talk about unconscious bias. And one of the participants was being kind of combative and contrary and criticizing the workshop and kind of using direct quotes from the executive order. And as I have done many times before, I stayed in my professional role as a facilitator. I tamped down my personal feelings so that the whole room could learn. I took deep belly breaths to calm my threat response. I was patient. I listened for what she was really saying underneath her words, and I tried to meet her where she was. And in the end, she thanked me, and she said she was grateful for the opportunity to learn, and also grateful for the opportunity to be heard. And I realized in that moment that I was giving her, this stranger, more care and grace than I was giving my husband. With her, I could compartmentalize my feelings and stay in my logical mind in pursuit of learning. With my husband, I could not. That day, I decided to see if I could maybe try to bring some tools and tips home where so much emotional complexity and attachment lived. It would be the ultimate test. Did I really believe that diversity is a good thing? Or can I only coexist in my life with people who think just like me? This test started with a conversation in the kitchen. I remember it really well. We were like two boxers at the end of the final round. We were kind of busted up and staggering around, <laughs> exhausted, ready to throw in the towel. And there was something calm and quiet about the tone, despite its brutal honesty. We talked about things in a way that we had never talked about before in our entire relationship. 
He said some things. I said some things. It was not pretty. But it was a do or die moment. If we couldn't work things out, two people who raised three amazing children together, who held each other up through good and really bad, one of whom is a diversity professional, one of whom is a former SWAT teen crisis negotiator. <laughs> if we couldn't find a way forward through this, who could? So we stayed in the room, and we listened to one another, and we peeled back layer after layer after layer until we got to a place of deeper understanding and common ground and a whole new level of trust. Day after day, we continued to make a choice to stay in the room, to stay in the room long enough to lower defenses and listen to each other. And we actually experienced some healthy aha moments and gained important new insights into the most divisive concepts and issues of our day. Our minds didn't change necessarily. They expanded. In conversations with other people, we started using one another's ideas and words, which expanded those conversations and made room for more trust and created space for bigger ideas and learning. And it opened up the possibility for new connections and alliances in really unexpected places. None of this was easy. <laughs> but here are four things that I learned along the way, four things that I strongly believe. Number one, behind every twisted up angry face is some level of fear. And often that fear is rooted in experiences we had when we were young and vulnerable and impressionable. And I think we have to be willing to ask about and actually listen to the stories about what frightens someone else because those stories sit at the bottom of their worldview. When you ask, what is it about this thing that scares you? You will learn more about the destabilizing experiences that others have had and you will see more clearly how those experiences shaped them then and how they continue to influence them now. Number two, once you have a better understanding of someone else's fears, there are eight magical words you can say that will never fail to cool their anger and defensiveness and the, the, what surrounds those fears. I can see why you feel this way. Eight magical words. That simple statement may feel like agreement or surrender or concession, but it's not. You're simply saying, I get you, I see you. And it's a small, unheroic act of grace. And with grace comes softening and an opening up of hearts and minds. Number three, you're not all that. <laughs> If you really want to understand and reach someone, you must first admit and then abandon your sense of superiority over them. We sit on our high horses, and we judge people morally, and we swagger around with conceit and supremacy. We are so certain that we have it all figured out. And as long as we do this, we will never see the other person as someone who deserves to be heard let alone someone who just might teach us something. Number four, you don't have to be a pro. You don't have to have a suitcase of theories and evidence-based practices <laughs> to connect with someone on the other side of an issue. You just have to find a healthy way to stay in the room long enough to see that they are as complicated <laughs> and layered and conflicted and scared and as interesting as you are. <laughs> Last year, my husband and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. I can honestly say today we enjoy a deeper respect and understanding for one another than we did before. It's not all roses and candlelight, don't get me wrong. All relationships require care and feeding, especially when you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't see eye to eye with you all of the time in your socio-political worldview. It takes a little bit more care and feeding, and especially in this polarized climate. It requires making the intentional choice to see an opposing view as an essential complement, the yin to your yang, something that makes you smarter and stronger, not something as 
something to defeat and crush. When you do this, you wander into the spaces between the extremes where I think most of us live. Most of us don't live at the edges with the big mouths and the smash mouths and the hate mongers. And you start to realize that despite the differences, you're actually in the same foxhole, fighting against a common enemy of hate and division. That fight is worth it because what's the alternative to give up, to pull back the ladders, retreat and separate to our base camps and part ways? It scares me to think about this alternative, to consider what will happen if we don't try to cross the icy divides that seem to be cracking apart this brittle nation. And it probably scares you too. If you care about the people in your life who hold a different worldview, if you care about this country, then I invite you to the climb, to lay down a ladder and make your way across the crevasse, to dare to try to reach that seemingly unreachable summit, to have hope. Trust me when I tell you we can save this relationship. We are so much better together. Thank you. <laughs>